All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, for this uh, the next edition of TCS Plus. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Cheyenne Oves Garan from University of Washington to give the talk today. Uh, before we get to that, uh, let me introduce uh, the people who are working behind the scenes for TCS Plus. So today we have uh, Oded Regev, who's operating the talk. And um, offline, we also have Anindya Day, uh, Clement Canon, Gotham Kamat, and Thomas Hollenstein. So um, for that, maybe you want to introduce the, the groups who are joining us today? Yeah, let me start with the uh, group from um, TTI, Chicago. Harris is joining us there. Hi, guys. And the group from Paris, um, Lila Fontes and others there. Hi, everyone. And Piyush uh, Srivastava from uh, Caltech. Hi, guys. And Shachar is still setting up there. Shachar Lovet from UCSD. <laughs> Hi, everyone there. And we have the group from NYU, a few floors above me. Hi, guys. <laughs> and uh, we have Antonio heading the group from uh, the Simons Institute and UC Berkeley. Hi there. OK, so uh, back to you, Tom. Thanks, Oded. Um, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Cheyenne Oves garan from University of Washington uh, giving the talk today. Cheyenne got his uh, PhD a couple oh, years, ago PhD from years ago from Stanford. Oops, I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback. Shahar, can you mute yourself? Shahar, can you mute yourself? OK, Shahar is muted. So <laughs> Cheyenne got his PhD a couple of years ago from Stanford, advised by Amin Saberi, Luca Trevisan. Um, then he went to Berkeley for a year or a couple of years, and, and now he's at University of Washington. Uh, so Cheyenne has done a lot of breakthrough work in uh, approximation algorithms, in particular for traveling salesmen and asymmetric traveling salesmen problem including two best paper awards, one in uh, 2010 for breaking the log n approximation barrier for ATSP, um, and then in 2011 for getting a approximation, constant factor approximation fact, uh, algorithm for TSP. And today he's breaking the barrier for ATSP again, uh, going down from slightly under log n to poly log log n. Uh, so we're going to hear about that. Uh, before we get to the talk, let me say, um, what's coming. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have uh, Muli Safra talking about monotonicity testing. And then later on in the semester, we'll also have uh, Aaron Poteshin uh, talking about uh, uh, sum of squares, lower bounds for clique, and Aaron Roth um, talking about uh, statistical validity in data analysis. So I think uh, everyone's ready. So Cheyenne, uh, the, f the floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Thomas, and thanks for all of the organizers. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure speaking in the uh, TCS Plus. Uh, so I want to talk about today about the work I, I, were, I was doing for the last two years or so. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Nima Nari, who is a PhD student at uh, Berkeley. Uh, so, so this is a work about the traveling salesman problem and its connections to uh, to the recent works in spectral graph theory, in particular, the um, uh, the recent proofs of the recent proof of the Kadison Singer theorem by Markus Spielman and Shirvastava. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to start slowly by reminding you of TSP uh, and then talking about the connections of TSP and um, spectral graph theory. So maybe like half of the talk will just be about the previous works and how things are related to each other and then I'll tell you uh, the things that we've done. Um, okay, so let's start by reminding you of uh, TSP, uh, asymmetric TSP. Probably all of you are familiar with it. So we have a list of cities and their pairwise uh, distances satisfying the triangle inequality um, meaning that, say, the cost of going from here to San Francisco is less than the cost of going from, say, Seattle to Portland and then to San Francisco. Uh, uh, the goal is to find the shortest tour that visits all of the cities exactly once. And 
the asymmetric uh, in, uh, comes from the fact that uh, the cost function is not necessarily symmetric. So the cost of going from here to San Francisco could be different from the cost of going from San Francisco to here, maybe because of uh, the weekends or the uh, uh, I don't know, uh, where, where the work is done, whatever. So uh, so this is the problem. Uh, uh, okay, so there is a natural linear programming relaxation for this problem uh, proposed by Heldon Karp in 70s, and this is this is the this is the linear programming relaxation. You don't need to understand this relaxation for this talk. Just I just put it up there. Just know that this is a, like a simple LP relaxation. Um, for many years, people expected that this relaxation could be uh, useful, and we could uh, um, we, we could use a solution around them to obtain uh, a traveling to obtain a TSP tour. Uh, but for many years, we had no idea how how we should do that, and how and if it is possible to show that the value of this relaxation is close to the value of the optimum. Um, there is also this notion of integrality gap, which is basically the worst case ratio between the optimum solution of the relaxation and the optimum integral solution. Okay, so people believe that and conjecture that the integrality gap of this relaxation must be a constant, in the sense, in the sense that the, the, the value of this relaxation should give you a constant factor approximation of the value of the optimum. Okay. So, so this is about the LP. Now let me tell you what we knew about traveling asymmetric TSP before our work. So as you see, there are quite a lot of works on this problem. Uh, the first approximation algorithm was by Fries, Galbietti, and Maffioli in, a, in 80s. And several group of people tried to improve the constant in, in front of the login uh, un until like about five, six years ago. Uh, in a joint work with Asadpur, Gomez, Madri, and Saberi, we managed to improve this uh, log n asymptotically to a log n over log log n factor. Also, for some special cases, like plane around the genus graph, there is a like constant factor approximation. Now, if, you, if you're interested to know about the integrality gap, the best lower bound on the integrality gap is 2. This is the work of Charikar, Gomez, and Karloff, and the best upper bound is log n over log log n that follows from this proof uh, that we had a couple of years ago. So as you see, there's a huge gap between the lower bound and the upper bound on the, on the integrality gap. The NP hardness is also about 1.01. .01, so it's very close to 1. OK, so this is the state of the art uh, before our work. Now let me tell you what we've done. Uh, so this is the main result that for any cost function, the integrality gap of the LP relaxation is poly log log n. Okay, so uh, in other words, uh, the the value of the uh, the value of the LP gives the poly log log n approximation of the value of the optimum integral solution of the value of the optimum TSP tour. Okay, um, so uh, right now the proof is not algorithmic. We're, we're, I'll, I'll tell you more about why it is not algorithmic, but basically the main reason is that the proof of the Caddis and Singer theorem is not algorithmic, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, um, also, the constant here of poly log log is about uh, 10 or 12 or something like that. So, uh, okay, so uh, so that's the, that's the main result. Uh, if there is no question, let me give you the outline of the talk. All right. So, so here is the the outline of the talk. Uh, so, I'm gonna start from ATSP and then tell you a, a sequence of uh, generalizations of the problem. So, first we go from ATSP to a problem called the thin spanning tree problem. Uh, then I'll tell you we can even generalize that more and get to the spectrally thin, thin spanning tree problem. Then we'll talk about the connection of this spectrally thin spanning tree and the effective resistances of a graph and the Caddis and Singer problem. So this thing, these, these problems are very related to each other. 
So after I, I said all of this, we'll talk about what we've done. Okay, so maybe for the first half of the talk, we'll talk about this uh, top of the uh, top of this slide. All right, good. So let's start with the thin spanning tree problem. Okay, so so here is the definition. Uh, I'm going to spend some time on this slide. So uh, it's important to understand the definition of thin trees. Uh, so okay, so let's say we have we are given a KH connected graph. So 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 from now on. The graphs that, that I'm going to talk about are unweighted and they are undirected. So they are sort of simple families of graphs. They may have parallel edges, but for the sake of this talk, you may assume that they don't even have parallel edges. Um, so okay, so we say a graph is KH connected if uh, if in any cut of the graph there are at least K edges. Okay. Um, in other words, we say a graph is k-edge connected if for every pair of vertices there, is, there are k-edge disjoint paths going from one to the other. Uh, another definition, sort of almost equivalent, is that a k-edge connected graph is a union of k over 2 edge disjoint spanning trees. So you can just think of it as a union of k, k over 2 edge disjoint spanning trees. Okay, so we have such a k-edge connected graph. Uh, we say a spanning tree T is alpha thin with respect to G if for every cut the number of edges of the tree in the cut is at most alpha times the number of edges of the graph in the cut. Okay? So let me give you an example. So let's look at the let's look at the complete graph in the on N vertices in the left and say I have a Hamiltonian path in the right. Now, if I look at the cut, say, separating L vertices from N minus L vertices, the number of edges in this cut is exactly L times N minus L. The number of edges of the tree in the cut is at most 2L because the degree of every vertex is at most, is at most 2. So the ratio of the number of edges of the tree and the graph is about 2 over N minus L, something like that. So, so in the worst case, the tree this ratio is about 2 over n or 4 over n. So you get a t 2 over n thin tree. Uh, and note that the, here the connectivity is k in the complete graph. So, so basically the, the thinness of the tree, this alpha, is about 2 over the connectivity. Okay. Another interesting example is to find a 1 over k thin tree in a k-dimensional cube hypercube. Uh, that's a very nice exercise. Uh, it's interesting that if you work on this exercise, you see that the Hamiltonian path is not necessarily always uh, a, Hamilton, uh, a good thin tree. It may be a very bad thin tree. Okay, but uh, all right. So, um, uh, so in general, uh, we would like to prove, to, to find a tree well, uh, where alpha is about uh, 1 over k, a constant over k. Uh, and it's conjectured that such trees exist. We don't know how to prove it. Even even getting it alpha less than 0.99 is an interesting problem, and we don't know how to solve that either. Okay. So in other words, getting a tree such that for every cut the tree has at most 99% of the edges of that cut. Even that's not an easy problem. Um, okay. Uh, this problem is also closely related to the cut sparsifier problem. So, if you are familiar with the cut sparsifier problem, uh, you can think of a, you can think of this question as a one-sided cut sparsifier problem. Okay. So, if if in the left side of this uh, equation, I wanted the number of edges of a tree to be alpha times the number of edges of a graph, up to a one plus or minus epsilon factor, then I could say that a tree gives a very good approximation of the graph up to 1 plus or 1 minus epsilon factor. But I don't have any lower bound on the edges of a tree, so uh, so th that's why this is a one-sided cut sparsifier. So it's, it's sort of an easier question in that sense, but it's not easier in the sense that we want the tree to be unweighted. Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a, um, 
extensive literature on the uh, on, on the weighted cut sparsifier. We know that weighted cut sparsifiers exist, and they have very few edges, like linear number of edges, but but they are weighted. For this problem, we want the sparsifier to be unweighted. Okay, so yeah. that's yes. When you say hard, do you mean hard computationally here, or is it also a mathematical question of whether you can achieve alpha being 0.99? I mean hard mathematically. You don't even know how to prove it mathematically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so is this definition clear? Good. Now let me tell you the connection of this problem and the asymmetric TSP. And the asymmetric TSP. So, so here is the connection. If any log n edge connected graph has an alpha thin tree for alpha less than f of n over log n for some function f, then the integrality gap of the LP is order of f of n. So just a, an existential mathematical proof is enough to show that the integrality gap of the LP is order of f of n. Now, if you can find the tree algorithmically, like in polynomial time, that gives you an order of f n approximation algorithm for ATSP. Okay, so the proof of this theorem, uh, this, this is a theorem that we proved a couple of years ago in this work with Asad Pur, Gomez, Madri, and Sabari. Uh, um, the proof of it uses the max flow Minka theorem. It's, 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 it's not a complicated theorem. It's basically, uh, basically what you do is that you, you say that if I start from the tree uh, and I have it as a lower bound, uh, I, I try to route a flow in the graph where where the tree is a lower bound on the flow, then I can do that, and the cost of the flow that I'm getting is basically proportional to the thinness of the tree. Okay, so basically you st you, you use the tree to find a TSP tour. That's that's how you do it. Um, and this log n connectedness uh, comes from the fact that you can, if you start from the LP solution. Basically, without loss of generality, you can assume that the fraction of every edge is uh, is a const is is a multiple of one over log n. Okay, so so up to so when you scale it up, you get a log n connected graph. All right. So um, now let me tell you what do we what what did we know about thin tree problem prior to our work. Uh, Basically, the main previous the, the main previous works on, on thin tree problem were, were were using randomized rounding ideas. Okay, so so here is a very simple like, simple theorem to prove that any k connected graph has a log n over k thin tree. Okay, so so here is a, here is a proof. All you need to do is to sample each edge of the graph independently with probability, say, 2 log n over k. Now, if you do that, you can see that the expected size of every cut of the graph is, is at least log n, is at least 2 log n. Now, you can use chain of, chain of types of concentration bounds and Karger cut counting arguments to show that this is enough to, to argue that uh, the, the to argue that the graph that you get when you do the when you when you sample the edges is is log n over k connected because the expected size of every cut is log n over k so the graph is log n over k connected by chain of bound and once you have a log n over k connected graph any thin and any spanning tree of that graph is also log n over k thin I mean this is a general property if you have a thin uh, if you have a thin subgraph, any subgraph of your subgraph is also have also the same thinness. If you have an alpha thin subgraph, any subgraph of it also has a has the same uh, thinness, or a, or maybe a better thinness. So so that that's one way to get an alpha thin tree. You get a connected graph with log n over k uh, thinness, and any spanning tree of that is log n over k thin. Okay. Now you can improve this. Uh, a little bit to log n over k log log n, and this is what we did in this uh, 2009 work. And basically, the idea is that instead of sampling the edges independently, you wanna you wanna um, use a sort of correlated distribution. You wanna use a dependent sampling, and you wanna 
basically sample the edges. Instead of sample the edges independently, you want to sample a random spanning tree. But the point is, when you sample a random spanning tree, you know that the the the, the sample solution is connected with probability one. So you just need to use the churn of bound to to say that uh, you, your, the deviation in each cut is small. And basically, the point is that the the right side, the upper tail of the churn of bound, is a little bit stronger than the uh, lower tail like, or left tail of the churn of bound. So that gives you a log log n improvement over the simple log n over k uh, thinness that you could get from the uh, independent sampling. Okay. So so basically, the upshot is that. Uh, the previous works ma mainly use randomized rounding, either uh, independently or with a little bit of correlation to choose random spanning trees. Okay, so uh, so here is what we did. We proved that uh, any KH connected graph has a poly log log n over k thin tree. Okay, so. Uh, so, so from 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 the theorem that we showed in this slide, uh, this f of n is poly log log n, so we get a poly log log n uh, integrality gap for the LP. We cannot right now we cannot construct the tree algorithmically, so this just this gives a bound on the integrality gap. But if you can find the tree, it also gives an algorithm. Okay, so from now on, I will only talk about this top result. So, so from now on, you can just forget about ATSV, forget about the LP relaxation and all of these stories. Just think of this mathematical graph theoretic question. That is to show that any KH connected graph has a polylog log n over K thin tree. Okay, also note that uh, this doesn't give you this alpha less than 0.9. 0.99 that I was talking about because here I have a dependency to n. If you want to show that any graph has a 0 .9, 0 0.99 thin tree, you don't want any dependency to the size of the graph. You want that if n is exponentially or double exponentially larger than k, still the same thing is true. There is a 0.99 thin tree. Okay, so, so from now on, I'm, I, I will only talk about the top result. Okay, so so basically, you can see our result as a as a way of getting around the randomized rounding technique. Okay, so the randomized rounding technique has been used for many years in the area of approximation algorithms, and this log n or log n over log log n factor or barrier that you see is is something that you see in many other problems, like routing problems and. Um, uh, many other things, uh, and the reason is that churn of types of bounds, when you use them on, you know, and and different, uh, when you want to use, when you want to bound deviations on n different uh, quantities, you have to pay this log n over or log n over log log n factor. Uh, so so what we want to see here is how to go beyond that, using spectral techniques. Uh, by the way, if you ask a computer what's a thin tree, here are uh, the uh, here are the two uh, uh, answers I got. The, the right is, I think, the answer of uh, Google, and the left figure is the answer of Bing. <laughs> so it's for you to decide which of them is a better thin tree. Uh, all right. Uh, Okay, so so now I want to talk about uh, a generalization of the thin tree problem, known as the spectral thin tree. Before that, I need to remind you of the graph Laplacian. Okay, so this slide is a very short uh, introduction to graph Laplacian, and then I, I will I will define a spectral thin trees, which are a generalization of uh, thin trees. Okay, so okay, so just to make uh, make up some make up the notation, let's say B I J. Is the vector one i minus one j? It's a vector which is one in the coordinate i and minus one in the coordinate j and zero everywhere else. Uh, now, you can define the Laplacian of a graph or the Laplacian of a subset of a graph. So, for any subset of edges, the Laplacian of that subset is just uh, the summation of the edges in that subset of bij bij transpose. 
you can think of BIJ BIJ transpose as just the Laplacian of a single edge. It's a matrix where it is equal to one in the ii and jj entry and minus one in the ij and j i entry and zero everywhere else. Okay. Uh, the Laplacian of a graph uh, is just the Laplacian of some of the Laplacian of the all of the edges. Here is an example for a for a four cycle. You see that on the diagonal. Sorry. You see that. On the diagonal, you would have the uh, you would have the uh, the degree of the vertices, and off diagonal entries are minus one if there is an edge and zero otherwise. Now there is this notion of Laplacian quadratic form, where for a vector x, we will look at the x transpose L, L t of x or L g of x, and it is exactly equal to summation of among all of the edges in the subset that I'm looking at. The writing it's uh, Laplacian of xi minus xj squared. Okay, so in particular is an interesting example. If x is the indicator vector of a set, then this 1s transpose lt1s is exactly equal to the num to the number of edges in that in the cut separating s from its complement, because because this xi minus xj is one if uh, i and j are in different sides of a cut and zero otherwise. Okay, so let's say we are now familiar with the graph Laplacian. Now let me tell you about spectrally thin trees. So, so thin tree question is is a very sort of nice question because uh, it's uh, it's. It's, it's just a graph theoretic question about undirected, unweighted graphs, right? There are no uh, sort of uh, complicated assumptions, but it's it's not nice in the sense that it's if if I give you a, a tree, if I give you a thin tree of a graph, it's not easy to uh, to verify the thinness of that graph. Okay. I don't know of any polynomial time algorithm that gives me a thinness of a tree. Even analytically, this is not easy to do. Like the best way that I know is to just go go over all of the cuts in the graph. Okay, uh, if I want to find it exactly. Now it's it's basic that like testing the thinness is basically a variant of the sparse cut problem. So you can use approximation algorithm for a sparse cut problem to approximate thinness. But even that is not so el eliminating. Now let me tell you about the spectrally thin trees, and we'll see that they are much nicer to uh, to to understand. Uh, okay. Um, so here is the definition. We say a spanning tree T is alpha spectrally thin with respect to a graph G if the Laplacian of the tree is at most alpha times the Laplacian of the graph. Okay, and this is less than or equal to is a is in the positive semi-definite sense in the sense that alpha times L of G minus L of T is a positive semi-definite matrix. So this is the uh, equivalent definition that for any test vector X, X transpose LT of X is less than alpha times X transpose LG of X. Okay. Now, now this definition has two advantages. One is that it, it's a generalization of thin tree, and a second is that it is very easy to test, and it is very easy to uh, quantify mathematically or analytically. Okay, so so let's see why. Uh, so it generalizes this combinatorial thinness. Uh, why? Because if if T is a is an alpha spectrally thin tree, it is also alpha combinatorially thin. Why is that the case? If I choose X to be the indicator vector of a set, then this Top inequality gives me that 1s transpose lt1s is less than alpha times 1s transpose lg1s. But this thing is just the number of edges of the tree in the cut SS complement. This is the number of edges of the graph in the cut SS complement. So I get that the tree is alpha combinatorially thin. So you see that when, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm forcing, when I'm, at, when I'm saying a tree is alpha spectrally thin, I'm saying that not only the tree is Good with respect to cuts. It's good with respect to any any real any vector in the in Rn. So that's a much more general statement than than just saying that the tree is thin with respect to cuts. Okay. Now because of this generality, it is easier to test in polynomial time. It's easier to write uh, or to quantify mathematically. So to 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 see to find the thinness of a given tree T, all I need to do is to find the max eigenvalue of the following matrix. 
the inverse of uh, L of G, the square root of the inverse of L of G, L of T is square root of inverse of L of G. I mean, just note that L of G is not uh, is not a uh, is is a is a singular matrix, so the inverse is not well defined. But here I'm I want I'm, I'm talking about the pseudo inverse. Okay, but just forget about it. Just for the sake of this talk, just assume that it is uh, invertible. L of G is invertible. Now the way to to get to this is that I mean, if L of T is less than alpha times L of G, then I can just multiply both sides of this inequality with the square root of uh, LG inverse, and that gives me that uh, this matrix is less than alpha times I. So the max eigenvalue of this is at most alpha. Okay, so I can mathematically quantify the uh, spectral thinness of a tree. Shen? Yeah? I'm just curious, is there any reason why you don't just subtract one matrix from the other and check if it's positive semi-definite? That, that would also work. Here it's uh, it, it's nicer to quantify this way because it's it's just, I mean, even if you do that, then, then yeah, then you need to test the positive semi-definiteness or I guess, yeah, or negative semi-definiteness of a matrix. This, this just results in max eigenvalue type question. And and we know how to think about these kinds of questions because of this work of Caddis and Singer. I'll, I'll say a little bit more later. But this this also gives you directly alpha, right? If you subtract, then you need to guess alpha, subtract, text, test if it's PSD. Here you have a characterization maybe of alpha directly as the larger second value. Yeah, exactly. This gives you exact characterization. Then there you have to do a binary search, sort of. That's true. Okay, so now we understand the spectral thin trees. Next, I want to tell you. Uh, uh, next, I want to tell you that uh, a, a necessary and a sufficient condition for a spectral thinness. Okay, so it turns out that unlike a spectral, uh, unlike combinatorially thin, combinatorial thin, thin tree question, uh, there are k-connected graphs that have uh, no spectral thin trees. Okay, so we cannot argue that any any k-connected graph has a spectral thin tree. So that's a sort of bad news for us. Uh, we may not be able to always find these graphs, but on the other hand, because of their nice structure, there are some general theorems that say that under some conditions, a graph has a spectral thin tree. Okay, so so I want to tell you about this. So. So first, let me start with a necessary condition for a spectral thinness, and then uh, a necessary condition for uh, uh, for a tree being alpha spectrally thin. So here is a lemma, a simple lemma, that uh, the spectral thinness of any tree T is at least the maximum effective resistance of the edges of the tree in the graph. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the effective resistance of an edge, it's just the following quantity. Oh, sorry, this should have been i comma j. So, so the effective resistance of uh, i j uh, of an edge i j is just b i j transpose the inverse of l of g b i j. Okay, and remember b i j is this vector which is one in the ith coordinate and minus one in the jth coordinate. So. Uh, so the effective resistance that there are many equivalent definitions of it uh, in terms of random walks or electrical flows, but this is a sort of a, a spectral definition. Um, uh, it, it's basically leverage scores of the of the Laplacian matrix of the inverse of the Laplacian matrix. Okay, so so the claim is that the spectral thinness of a tree is at least the maximum effective resistance of its edges. Let's see how to prove it. So let's say I have a tree T that is alpha spectrally thin. Okay, now I told you that the thinness is sort of a downward close property. If you have a alpha thin subgraph, then any subgraph of it is also alpha thin. So in particular, any subgraph of a tree is alpha spectrally thin. So, so just a single edge of the tree that, that I have is also spectrally thin. So if E is an edge in the tree, this BE, BE transpose, which is just the, the Laplacian of the edge, is alpha spectrally thin with respect to the graph. Okay? L of E is less than the L of T and less than alpha times L of G. Now, what, now, 
point is that effective resistance is just the spectral thinness of an edge. Okay, so so look at this top inequality. If L of E is less than, or B, B, E, B, E transpose is less than alpha times L of G, and if I multiply both sides of this inequality by the square root of the inverse of L of G, I'm going to get the following. I'm going to get that B E transpose L G inverse B E is less than alpha. The max eigenvalue of this is less than alpha. Okay, so so and th that's it. Okay, so so to summarize, what what did I what did I do? I, I said that uh, the spectral thinness of any tree is at least the maximum effective resistance. The reason for that is that first of all, any edge of the tree, uh, the spectral thinness of any edge of the tree is uh, um, is uh, is less than or equal to the spectral thinness of the whole tree, but the spectral thinness of a single edge is just as effective resistance. So if a tree has an edge with big effective resistance, that means that that tree cannot be a good thin tree. And so, Shayan, so this would not be the case if you only knew that the tree was thin, but not spectrally thin? Yeah, exactly. The tree could have been thin, combinatorially thin, and having edges with big effective resistance. So now let me give you an example to understand this better. Okay? So this is an example that shows that there is a KH connected graph uh, with no spectrally thin tree, although it has a combinatorially thin tree, a 1 over K combinatorially thin tree. Any tree of this graph is even worse than 0.99 spectrally thin. It's very close to 110. Okay, so so in particular, any any spanning tree of this graph, the uh, the, f, the max effective resistance of the edges of the tree is one minus k squared over n. So it's very close to one. And think of k. K is very small. Like k is log n or something small. Okay. So what's the graph? There are k parallel paths going from left to right in the top and in the bottom, and then there are and then there are k edges in this cut separating the top and the bottom. Now the claim is that all of these edges in all of these vertical edges have effective resistance very close to 1, 1 minus k squared over n. Now if that is true, then any tree must have at least one edge, one vertical edge. So in any tree, the max effective resistance is at least 1 minus k squared over n. So, so there is no spectral thin tree. But if you look at it, this this tree in pink, in pink is 1 over k combinatorially thin. Okay. Now let me argue that why 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 don't I get a, uh, why it is not true that uh, okay. Let, let me say that why vertical edges have effective resistance very close to one. Okay. So let's let's say let me prove that this left edge has effective resistance very close to one. Okay. So to see that. I'm going to use this other definition of effective resistance, which is that to test the effective resistance of an edge, what you do is that you want to send one unit of flow, like one unit of electrical flow from one endpoint to the other endpoint and see what is the energy of the flow. The energy of the flow gives you exactly the effective resistance between these uh, endpoints. Now, if I send one unit of flow from to the top top left vertex and extract it from the bottom left vertex, what happens is that most of the flow would go through this edge directly. Very few of it would go all the way to the right and then down and all the way to, to the left. Why? Because, because you know, if you go, like, this, this path is so long, right? It, it, it has n over k vertices and think of n as being so large. So if you go all the way to the right, it, you, it, you exhaust so much energy that, you know, it's, it's, the electricity never does that. It just goes directly from top to the bottom. So the effective resistance of it, this edge is very close to one. Okay? Now, another way of thinking the same thing is that effective resistance between a pair of vertices will be as small if there are many edge disjoint paths from one endpoint to the other which are short. If there are many short edge disjoint paths, the effective resistance is small because the energy with electricity would go sort of equally uh, on these paths. Now, k-edge connectivity gives us that for any pair of vertices, there are 
k edge disjoint paths from one to the other. But this path could be very long. There is no bound on their length. That means that electricity would not necessarily go through all of them if they are, if they are very long. Okay. So 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 k edge connectivity. As, as I'm going to say later, is that it's sort of a, a weaker version than having a small effective resistance. If you have a small effective resistance, you get that graph is highly connected, but not vice versa. All right, sounds good. Now, now, so I told you a necessary condition. Now let's tell you a sufficient condition for a spectral thinness. So it follows from this theorem of uh, Marcus Spillman Srivastava that. Uh, so, so they, they proved the Caddis and Singer theorem. It was a very nice result, uh, uh, but I'm not going to tell you tell you about that in this talk. A byproduct of the result is the following theorem: that any graph G has a, a spectrally thin tree with a spectral thinness being maximum of effective resistance of all of the edges of the graph. Okay, so if every edge in the graph has a small effective resistance, then there is a good spectral thin tree. Okay, so this is this is a much more general statement than have than. Uh, and previously, I said that if I have a tree and all of its, for for the tree to be a good thin tree, I need that all of its edges having a small effective resistance. Now that. Sufficient condition is that all of the edges of the graph have a small effective resistance. Now, basically, the way you want to think about this theorem is that uh, it's sort of a spectral theorem, right? And the way they, they prove this kind of theorem, or at least they state this kind of theorems, is that uh, uh, is that you start from the graph, you look at these edges BE in the in the, in RN. They are like uh, you have one one vector per edge. These vectors be for for the edges of the graph. You have one vector per, per edge. Now, what they say is that if this set of vectors in this high-dimensional space are sort of uh, uh, symmetric, in a sense that there are not many of them in one direction, but very few in the other, then there are uh, thin bases in this in this high-dimensional space. Okay, or in our language, there are spectrally thin trees. Okay, so so you need sort of uh, symmet symmetric, uh, having a symmetric structure in the L2 uh, L2 space of of the vectors corresponding to our edges. So so a corollary of this theorem is that any edge transitive KH KH connected graph has a one over K spectral symmetry. If you're not familiar with edge-transitive graphs, you can think of them as symmetric graphs. These are the graphs where, for every pair of edges, there is a automorphism that map that edge to the other edge. So, okay, just think of them as symmetric graphs. So, in particular, you get the solution of the exercise. So, k-dimensional cube is a edge-transitive graph. It has a one over k spectral symmetry. Okay, sounds good. So, let me summarize what I said so far. So. Um, so, so ideally, we would like to prove the top, top, uh, top arrow. That is, we would like to show that any KH connected graph has a one over K combinatorially thin tree. That's the goal. And if you prove that, it gives a constant factor approximation for ATSB. Uh, now, what MSS does is this bottom arrow. They show that if effective resistance of every edge in the graph is one over K, is less than one over K, then the graph has a one over K spectrally thin tree. Okay, I, I told you that one over k spectral thinness implies one over k combinatorial thinness, so we can go from the bottom right to the top right. But unfortunately, KH connectivity doesn't imply having a small effective resistance. It's in fact the other way around. Having small effective resistance corresponds to having many paths, many parallel, many edge disjoint, many short edge disjoint paths between the endpoints of all of the edges. Okay, so small effective resistance implies KH connectivity, but not vice versa. Because KH connectivity just says there are many edges shown paths, which could be very long. So, in other words, you can think of this, you can think of the question that we're trying to answer as the L1 version of the Caddis and Singer problem, or the Caddis and Singer problem as the L2 version of our problem. Okay? In particular, like 
in our question, we have edges and a graph, and we're looking at cuts, which are like L, sort of L1 questions about the graphs. And in this Caddis and Singer work, they have vectors that are, that are the corresponding notion of edges. And instead of cuts, they're looking at uh, uh, test vectors, which, which could be any vector in Rn, like the, the eigenvalues type of questions, which, which are basically the L2 version of cuts. Okay, so, 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 okay, so that's the sort of picture. Now, I'm going to tell you what, what, we, what we've done in next, but just from this picture, basically what we do is that we say how we can go from the top right, to, sorry, top left to the bottom left. Not, not necessarily to the bottom left, to something similar to the bottom left. Okay, so in other words, we want to say how we can go from the, uh, uh, from this L1 assumption to L2 assumption, from K connectivity to having small effective resistance, and then use this L2 tools, the spectral tools that we have to get a spectral thinness and finally get a combinatorial th thinness out of it. Okay. Is there any question? So I thought your example showed that there's no hope to get spectral thinness just based on KH connectivity. Yeah. So, so as I'm going to tell you is that I, I'm, I'm not going to give get spectral thinness for the original graph. I'm going to get a spectral thinness for a different graph. But it would be good enough that it will also be a spect it will also be combinatorially thin in our case. Yes. Okay. So, so here is here is like a, a sh like one line summary of our main idea. So, so I told you that this Caddis and Singer work, uh, Caddis and Singer result works if if our if we have sort of a symmetric L2 structure. If the vectors BE correspond or BIJ correspond to the edges, are sort of symmetric in L2, okay? Or the edges have sort of equal or semi-equal effective resistance. Now, our idea is to try to massage the graph, change it a little bit, add a few edges in order to symmetrize the L2 structure of a graph, symmetrize or equalize the effective resistances of the edges while preserving the L1 structure. Okay? If I can do that, then I can hope that to find a spectral thin tree for the new graph because it is symmetric, but because I haven't changed the L1 structure or the cut structure, any spectral thin tree of the new graph will be combinatorially thin with respect to the original graph. So let me let me give you an example of this to see uh, uh, to see how to see how I can do that. So remember, I, I had this. Two, uh, I had two uh, two paths of uh, um, of uh, two, two KH disjoint paths uh, going from left to right, and then I had this uh, uh, I, I had this vertical edges from top to the bottom. Now uh, here is an idea to make the effective resistance of all of the vertical edges small. Okay, the idea is to add these red edges. Okay, so so basically, I'm adding k parallel red edges between each uh, consecutive uh, endpoints of the uh, vertical edges, from one to n over k, n over k to two n over k, and so on and so forth. Okay, now the claim is that the effective resistance of every edge in this new graph. So I think of d as the red edges that I've added. The claim is that the effective resistance of every edge in this new graph is going to be less than one over root k all of the black edges in this new graph will be less than 1 over root k. And, okay, so what, what's, what's the intuition of it? The intuition is that, say, again, I want to route one into flow from the top left vertex to the bottom left vertex. Now, the thing is that these red edges shortcut the long path that I couldn't go through. Previously, if I wanted to go through all of, through the whole long path, it, I would exhaust so much, so much energy that I would never do that. Now, using this red edges, I can just shortcut through it, get directly to the, say, short, shortcut from the first vertex, get to the end point of the second vertical edge, and then come down and then uh, go back. Or I can do, I can use the red edges twice to, to go uh, 
to shortcut twice and go two hops and then come down and then come back and so on and so forth. So, so in other words, the red edges shortcut the long paths for me and that makes the effective resistances small. And the important thing is that the red edges are not changing the cut structure of the graph. So the cut structure of the new graph, which is the sum of the red and black, is uh, sorry, uh, the sum of the red and black is the same as the cut structure of the original graph up to a factor of two. So any spectral thin tree of the new graph will also be combinatorially thin with respect to the original graph. Okay. So so let me now. Uh, to, to say our idea more precisely, uh, let me first give you a simple observation. I told you that if effective resistances of all of the edges are small, then um, uh, then um, there is a spectral thin tree. Now, something a little bit more general also holds true using this work of MSS, which is that if average effective resistance of edges in every cut is small, then there is a spectral thin tree as well. So I don't need all of the edges to have a small effective resistance. As long as I look at every cut and the average effective resistance is small, that's already good enough to get a spectral thin tree. Okay, so it could right. be that in some cuts there are edges with effective resistance one or close to one. As long as the average is good, I'm fine. Quick question. I, I think you said this already, but so just for the path that you're taking right now, so here you're constructing a uh, spectrally thin tree for a new graph, and from that you're going to get a combinatorially thin, trin, thin tree for the new graph, which will also be combinatorially thin for the old graph because the cut structure didn't change, but it's not going to be spectrally thin for the old graph. So you're sort of bypassing exactly. that part. So, but, okay, thanks. Okay, so here is the main idea. Uh, more quant uh, quantitatively. So, so we want to find a graph. It will not be a graph at the, end of, at the end of the day, but think of it as a graph, D, such that it has two properties. The first is that the maximum effective resistance of all of the edges with respect to D plus G is 1 over K, or close to 1 over K. The second property is that D is less than G in the cut sense. So I'm going to use this notation, L of D less than L of G uh, with this sub subscript C to note that for every S, 1S transpose L of LD 1S is less than 1S transpose LG 1S. So every cut in D is less than G, uh, every, every cut in D is at most G. Okay, now suppose I, I can find such a graph D here is what happens next. So I'm going to look at D plus G. Now, the point is that for every cut in D plus G, I know that all of the edges of G has a small effective resistance. And D, the, number, the contribution of the edges of D is not so much. So the average effective resistance in every cut is maybe if it was 1 over k in G, now in D plus G is at most maybe 2 over k. It's at most twice of what it was before. So the average effective resistance of edges in every cut is small. That says that uh, by this extension of MSS, simple extension, any spectral thin tree of G plus D, sorry, it says that G, G plus D has a, combina has a spectral thin tree. But I know that any spectrally thin tree of G plus D is combinatorially thin in G because the cut structure is preserved. Okay, so all I need to do is to find this graph D. Okay, and this is basically this is the step that I bypass the spectral thinness barrier. So although G originally doesn't have the spectral thin tree, this D plus G will have a spectrally thin tree. Okay. This is also very reminiscent of the uh, ARV relaxation, if you're familiar with it. So if you look at the dual of the ARV relaxation, basically what they're doing is that they want to use Shiger inequality to, to solve this part of the Scott problem, but that doesn't work. The spectral techniques doesn't work. So what they, so what I do is that you, they, change the, they change the spectral structure of the graph while preserving its cut structure. So they add something to the graph preserving the cut structure, make the spectral structure nice, and make the graph uh, into an expander, and then they use the uh, Chigger inequality. 
So they don't use sugar inequality in the original graph. They add some edges, preserve this cut structure, and then they use sugar inequality. Here it's sort of the same story. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so so when we were here, we thought that okay, how hard could it be to to prove that such a D exists? The thing is that this top problem is a convex optimization problem. You can just look at it, formulate the dual, and think about the dual. And you know, we expected to do it like I don't know in two months or so, uh, but after like one or two months, we found out that uh, there are graphs where there is no good D, there is no, uh, we cannot do that, okay? So here is a bad graph, there is a cage connected graph such that for any, for any D, not just graph, for any, like, for any graph D, for any matrix D, if I look at the effective resistance of all, like max effective resistance of edges of my graph with respect to D, it is very big, it's very close to one, okay? So what's the graph? Again, I have K parallel paths from left to right, and then I have some additional edges. So I have these two hops that go from one to third, fifth, seventh, and so on. Then I have some four hops, eight hops, and so on and so forth. I have these login layers of edges, building up the last, uh, the this K parallel paths, and the, so the, the bottom edges, the K parallel path edges, the, these edges are good. All of their effective resistance is very is about one over k, but but the new edges they will have big effective resistance, and it is not possible to 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 bring down that effective resistance far away from one. Okay, um, it's not easy to see what, why you cannot bring down the max effective resistance here. Our proof uses the dual of of a convex program. Okay, but uh, but somehow you can imagine it. Right? If I try to bring down the effective resistance of the lo longest edge, that's you know I I've exhausted so much of the uh, budget on the cuts that I had, and then I cannot you know I cannot uh, decrease the effective resistance of the rest of the edges. So sort of that's that's the story. Okay. So okay. So so we get to this impossibility sort of theorem again. Uh, now. What what should we do next? This is sort of a similar story. If you if you're familiar with this literature on the uh, use of electrical flows to solve max flow, the work of Cristiano et al. They sort of uh, have the same problem that if you're trying to use electrical flows to solve max flow, there could be some edges with big effective resistance that prevent you from getting uh, 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 from from getting a max flow out of electrical flow. So what they do, they say that, okay, if you have an edge with big effective resistance, let's just delete it and work with the remaining graph. So we try to do sort of the same thing here as well. Say, okay, let's try to delete the, the long edges. But here the situation is very, uh, is more complicated because the graph is loosely connected. K is about log n, it's something very smaller than n. So, so you're not free to delete many edges. Like as long as you delete K, the graph may become disconnected. This is not the case in the max flow type problems. They could they could delete uh, many edges sort of for free. So this makes our life harder, but still we can we say that we we can prove that it's enough. So so actually we don't delete edges. What we say is that uh, we look at some, we don't care about some of the edges. We don't bring down. We don't decrease the effective the max effective resistance of all of the edges. We decrease the max effective resistance among a subset of edges, which is good enough for us. Okay, so here is the here is the overview of our proof. So uh, so we start from a k k h connected graph. There is some technical assumption that k being more than log n, but we start from a k h connected graph. Forget about this box for a second. Then we we find some graph D such that D plus G has a one over k spectral in tree. And then an spectral thin tree of D plus G will be combinatorially thin in G. Okay, now let me say what we have in this box. Uh, so, so here is what we have in, the, in, the, in, the, in this box. We, we say that uh, there is a 
matrix D is a, P, a positive definite matrix D. Or it's not it's not necessarily a graph, so it's a it's a positive def, definite matrix, and a set F of edges such that F is K connected. So F F are the good edges. The edges not in F are the bad edges. Edges with with big effective resistance. Okay, so F is K connected, K over two connected, let's say, and the max effective resistance of edges of F with respect to D is at most one over K. So it's not true that max effective resistance of all of the edges is small, only those in F are small with respect to D. Okay, so for example, in, in this example, the F edges could be just the, 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 the bottom edges, the K parallel paths. All of them has effective resistance 1 over K. So I can just let F be those edges and make D be, I don't know, just the Laplacian of the graph. Okay? I, D does not have to be something complicated here. Okay? Um, so, okay, so D is not necessarily a graph. That's one thing. The second problem with, with this statement is that uh, F may be very sparse with respect to that to our graph. It's true that F is say k over two connected, although our graph is k connected. But that doesn't mean that F has half of the edges of every cut of the graph. It could be that in a cut of the graph there are n edges, and F has only k over two edges. Okay, so a, F can be very sparse with respect to our graph. Now, because of this, I cannot say that the average effective resistance of edges in every cut is small. It could be that the average is big in some of the cuts. Okay? Therefore, uh, therefore, we cannot directly use this MSS or the extension of MSS. Simple, simple extension of MSS. We have to generalize MSS and show that these kinds of guarantee is enough for us. So. If we have such a f, then I can show that uh, d plus g has a spectrally thin tree supported on g. And that gives me a combinatorially thin tree in g. Okay. So since we are going out of time, let me uh, do the following. Let me conclude the talk. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be back tell you a little bit more about these pieces these pieces okay so uh, so let me conclude the talk uh, sorry uh, okay so okay, so so, so what was the main idea? The main idea was to symmetrize the graph the L2 structure of the graph while preserving the L1 structure of the graph there are several tools used, used in this work. The first one is this tool of interlacing polynomials, uh, a method of interlacing polynomials introduced by Marcus Spinman Shirvastava. We have to use it and generalize it. Uh, there are lots of tools that we use in convex optimization, graph partitioning, and high dimensional geometry. Uh, here are some uh, future works and open problems. Uh, so right now, the the main part of this work, which is not algorithmic, is this proof of the Caddis and Singer proof, Caddis and Singer conjecture. This MSS result is not algorithmic, uh, so uh, so it's a very nice question to design an algorithm for that. Basically, if you don't like that, just think of the following: that if if I give you a graph where effective resistance of every edge is, is small, can you design an algorithm to give me a spectrally thin tree? in that graph, a point ninety nine spectral tree in that graph. Okay, that's a very nice question. The second question is that uh, we still don't know if C over K thin trees exist. Uh, variants of our proof can lead to that. There is, There are some difficulties, but there is no strong barrier to getting to C over K thin trees using our proof techniques. Such a result can give, would give you constant factor approximation algorithm for ATSP if you can find them Algorithmic. Even if you can prove them, it would imply the constant factor integrality gap. Now, subsequent to our results, Ola Svensson designed a constant factor approximation for ATSP, where the cost function is a graph metric. Okay, so it's a it's a shortest path metric of an unweighted graph. 
Okay, so so for some for this interesting special case, we know a constant factor approximation, but it's not clear if this can be generalized or if our ideas can be mixed to improve the log log n factor. Okay, so so I guess if there are questions, you can ask me. Otherwise, we can wait for people who want to leave, and then we can I can give you more, more details, maybe for like ten minutes or so. Yeah, so if there's if there's questions now, um, we can definitely take them now. Otherwise, we want to see what happens through MSS. Uh, any questions in the audience? I, I see no one leaving, so I think they're eager to see what's going to happen. But uh, all right, so let me give you a little bit more. Uh, sorry. Okay. Let me give you a little bit more uh, uh, questions of uh, what's happening here. So I want to give you. Okay, so, so is this is this slide? Uh, so, so 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 there's a question. So um, so you said uh, the Swenson result is for the asymmetric problem, but the metric is uh, on an undirected graph. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Wait, but then uh, the distance are symmetric, then, right? So it's yeah. You have a un you have a, sorry, you have an unweighted directed graph. Oh, okay, okay. Did I say undirected? <laughs> you have an unweighted uh, directed graph. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, all right. Uh, is is this proof overview slide clear? Any questions about this? So, so again, there are sort of two two difficulties here that you want to find d and the f. Okay, so you want to find a matrix d and a subset of edges which have a small effective resistance with respect to d. Okay, good. So let me now tell you about uh, this step uh, in one slide. Tell you basically. Uh, one slide summary of this generalization of MSS that we prove. Okay, so so we solve the following question, which we call it the thin basis problem. Okay, so what's what's the problem? We are given a set of vectors, uh, VEs, uh, in some d-dimensional space. Okay, and these, these these could be just think of capital E as a as a um, as a set of uh, elements, and I have one vector per element. Now, suppose they have the following two properties. The first one is that summation of the quadratic forms V, V, E transpose is less than the identity. Okay? Uh, and the second one is that the norm of these vectors is less than epsilon. Okay? So these are not two, not, not so restrictive assumptions. Uh, Basically, you can if, if you give me any set of vectors, I can just drop those with big effect with big uh, big norm, just just drop them away, and I can I can drop as much as much as of them as I like to make them less than i in the positive semi-definite sense. Okay, and the other thing is that this summation of quadratic form is a is a is a nice spectral object that you usually see. Another way of thinking about it. Is that uh, if you don't like this matrix form of it, you can think of it in another sense, in the sense that uh, for every direction in the space, if I project all of my vectors on that direction and look at the summation of the squares of the squares of the projections, that's at most one. Okay, so every in every direction of the space, if I project all of the vectors, summation of the projection squared is at most one. Okay, that's sort of equivalent. So, so there is no that there are no large projections in every direction. Sort of, it's it's it looks like a sphere or something like that. Okay. Um, now, there is an if that I haven't said yet. So, I need one more assumption. I'm going to say it in a second. But assuming that, the claim is that there is a basis. So, what's a basis? By basis, I mean a linearly independent set of vectors. Okay, 
So, so under some assumption, there is a basis such that the norm of this summation VEV transpose in my set is less than epsilon, order of epsilon. Okay, so so again, what do I want to do? I want to find a set of linearly. A, a, I want to I want to find the linearly independent set of vectors in this space, such that uh, so something like maybe maybe two of the vectors here. Uh, they are linearly independent, and their and the summation of the quadratic form in this set is much less than one. I mean, see that if if I take many vectors, the norm could be one, right? I, I want to get something where the norm is less than epsilon, and the norm is very small. Okay. Now, the, now let's see. So the question is, what should I have here for the assumption? Sure. <coughs> Just to make sure I understand, so uh, are you saying you have d vectors? The basis is, uh, spans the whole space, right? So you have d vectors? No, the, the basis must have d vectors. But but the input can have many vectors, can have exponentially more than d vectors. I don't know. Right, and just can you compare this to MSS? Yeah. So so MSS tells us that if we have equality here, if if summation of VEV transpose is equal to i, then this is true. Okay. So this is a much this is a much more sort of general statement because. Uh, you know, in some directions it could be okay. I, I agree that it makes more sense if the vectors are uh, if the vectors don't add up to i, it should make your life easier. But it is not necessarily the case because uh, the because you need to choose the vectors that span the whole space. Okay, so. So with this assumption, with being less than i and having norm less than epsilon, MSS can only give you can only give you a set of vectors um, maybe linear in d, uh, maybe d over two vectors or something like that of norm less than epsilon. It cannot give you a basis. Now what we need here is actually a basis. Yeah. I mean, so far a basis might not even exist, right? You you can very well yeah. So so um, certainly in this your if, vectors be zero and you're you're fine, right? Exactly. So certainly in this if I at least need to have a basis. So so that's a necessary condition, certainly. Yeah. Okay. And okay. So so what we prove is that uh, what we prove is that what you need is to have one over epsilon on this joint basis in this space. That's a that's that's a sufficient condition. So you need to have at least one basis. What I'm saying is that if you have, say, look at this, if you have one over epsilon on this joint basis in this space, that is enough. I mean, the importance of it is that it's sort of a combinatorial assumption. It's not a spectral assumption, right? But it's enough for us. Okay. So if you want to map this theorem to the setting of our question, these VE vectors are the BE vectors that we have. Okay, they're not BE. They're, they are BE after normalization. So, so VEs are uh, a square root of LG inverse times BE. So they are BEs after some normalization. And a basis uh, on VEs will just correspond to spanning trees in our case. Okay, so so bases are just spanning trees. VEs are BEs after normalization. Uh, this this max max norm being less than epsilon is the same as that uh, as that the vectors of set F have a small effective resistance. So I'm going to apply this theorem only to the set F that I that I uh, that I that, that I have. Okay, I know that they have a small effective resistance. So after normalization, the norm of the vectors that I get will be less than epsilon. Will be small. Okay. Uh, and this one over epsilon disjoint basis is exactly the k-connectivity assumption. Okay, in the sense of graph, remember that a graph is k-connected if they, if it has say k over two disjoint spanning trees. Okay, so so if I have a k-connected assumption, there are many disjoint spanning trees. In the vector language, there are many disjoint bases. Is the um... Basis you find going to be one of among one of the bases 
you're guaranteed to have, or do you recombine no. stuff? Yeah, you rec recombine. I mean, it could be that all of the bases that you have are, are very bad. No, 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 none of them is good. You can easily construct examples like that. So yeah, you have to. I mean, the thing is that if you're given such a, if you're given one over epsilon disjoint basis, you can construct a distribution on all of the bases, uh, on on all of the bases of your set, such that. Uh, the marginal probability of any single vector in that distribution is one over epsilon. Is sorry, is epsilon. Okay, so so you can you can basically combine these one over epsilon disjoint bases, construct exponentially supported uh, a big distribution with exponentially many bases, such that the marginal probabilities are very small, or about epsilon. That gives you enough randomness to use. Uh, uh, okay, to, to basically search in this space and find a good basis, sort of. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is one one piece of the, the thing that, that I wanted to say. Uh, of course, if I wanted to say more, I, I should have <laughs> I, I, I should have gone through all of the MSS and the extensions, but this is just one nice theorem. It, it may have many other applications that uh, I just wanted to say. Uh, now, good. Now let me tell you. Uh, let me tell you, like for two slides about this direction. Uh, this is sort of the main technical part of the paper. Uh, that is how to go from K connectivity to finding this D and a set F. Okay. So, so I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say that. Instead, I'm gonna say something uh, weaker. Okay, so all right. Uh, so here is a weaker goal. So instead of finding, say, say that instead of finding a set F that is K connected, I'm going to find a set F that has at least K K over two edges incident to every vertex. So in other words, I'm going to find a set F such that uh, it is good for the degree cuts, the cuts separating a vertex from the rest of the vertices. All right. So, so here is the claim. So how, how I'm going to do that? I'm going to prove. I'm, I'm going to we, we prove the following theorem that if we have a k-connected graph. There exists a matrix D, positive definite matrix D less than G in the cut sense, such that for every vertex, the average of the effective resistance of edges incident to V is less than epsilon. Or this should be less than epsilon. The average of the effective resistance of edges incident to V is less than epsilon. And for some epsilon, Till the like one over k or so. This is about log poly log k over k. Okay. Now, if I have that, then how do I construct the set F? Here is how I do it. So I let F be the edges with effective resistance, say at most twice of epsilon. Then, by Markov inequality, I know that the average is epsilon, so I know that half of the edges are at most twice the epsilon for every for every vertex. So for every vertex, if I look at the intersection of F with with the neighbors of the vertex V, I know that F has at least half of the edges incident to V. Degree of V is at least K, so the, this intersection is at least K over two. Okay, so this way I'm gonna get a set F, which is not necessarily K-connected. It could be that there are there could be cuts in the graph where F has no has no edges in them, but it is good in degree cuts. In the degree cuts, it has K over two edges, and this is already something non-trivial because just this theorem gives you that uh, gives you the existence of thin edge covers. Uh, uh, a subset of edges. Uh, remember, the edge cover is a subset of edges which are uh, adjacent to every vertex in the graph. It's like a matching or something. Like that, okay, and this this kind of thing gives you one over k thin edge cover. Something that uh, this is this is also highly non-trivial to prove. We don't we didn't know how to do it before. Okay, 
So let me say one slide about how, how we do this theorem. Uh, this is how we think about this theorem. So it turns out that this, expect, this expected like, average effective resistance of the edge is incident to a vertex. This is a convex function. So you can write a convex relaxation for this. So here is a convex relaxation. We want to find the matrix D, which is positive definite, and less than G in the cut sense. And you want to minimize this objective function. So what's the objective function? You want to look at the maximum over all of the vertices of the average effective resistance of the edges incident to that vertex. So you want to minimize the max average effective resistance. OK, so, so it turns out that this is a convex this is a convex function. It's a convex program. Why? Because uh, because of the convexity of matrix inverses. So if if you look at a plus b inverse, this is less than the average of a inverse and b inverse. Okay, for for positive definite matrices. So so this this gives you that uh, basically effective resistance is a convex function. So you can minimize the maximum effective resistance. Okay. Um, um, now, unfortunately, this convex program has exponentially many constraints. So if you look at this inequality, there is one constraint per, per set. There are like two to the n many constraints here. So you cannot run this convex program in polynomial time. But you can, you can write a sort of relaxation of it in polynomial time. That is, Instead of forcing D uh, to be less than G in every cut, I'm this way. I'm gonna basically make sure that D is a graph, and uh, basically I, I, I'm gonna think of D as a demand of a flow. Okay, so I'm gonna route the flow in in the graph uh, and let D be the demand graph of the flow. That gives me already that D is less than G in the cuts. It's, it's something weaker than what I have here, but uh, it, 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 it gives me that this, something like this holds, okay? This is, I mean, if you're familiar with ARV, this is what ARV does, okay? Instead of testing this among any cuts, they route a flow and then they make, they let D be the demand of the flow. Now, the important thing here is that, uh, is that of this subscript C that I have here, okay? So if I didn't have C, if I just had that uh, D is less than G, sorry, D is less than G in the PSD sense, <coughs> sorry, uh, then the optimum D would just be G, would just be L of G, okay? Because, um, yeah, because the larger D would be in the, in the PSD sense, it would be better. Now, basically, the main point of all of this work is to have this subscript C here. When you have this subscript C, you let D to change the spectrum of G while not changing the cut structure of G. Okay, so, okay, so basically, the main theorem of us is that the, okay, it's not the main theorem, but it's that the, for any k-connected graph, this op the optimum of this convex program is 1 over k, is poly log k over k. To show that, we have to look at the dual. Uh, it takes another hour to go through the dual and prove something like this. But uh, but that's sort of the, the main, that, that, that's sort of the, uh, the idea, that we look at the dual of this program and we show that its dual is small. Now, this, this already doesn't give me the, uh, the theorem that I wanted that to have to have a set F uh, that is K, that is say K over two connected in all that is K over two connected only works for the degree cuts. Now to, to get from here to all of the cuts in the graph, you need to do a little bit more work. You need to uh, you need to sort of uh, partition the graph into expanders, use variants of this theorem, variants of this convex program that we just talked about, say that if you have expanders, you, you take care of the degree cuts that already gives you, uh, that, that, that's already enough for every cut, and then when you partition into expanders, you can 
basically start from degree cuts and sort of extend this to many to any cuts of the graph. Okay, so there are some uh, graph partitioning steps uh, hidden here. So. Okay, any questions? All right, so. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. So again, this was the main result that any KH connected graph has a polylog log n over k thin chi. That implies that for any cost function, the integrality gap of the LP relaxation is polylog log n. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, Questions? Uh, so, one quick question: Are we? Did we? Did we already say why we get log log n? And are we supposed to see that? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of tildes, right? Uh, I was also wondering where it shows up, but uh. right. So, so these okay. So, so all of these tildes that I have here are basically log k, like poly log k over k. So. Okay. So yeah, so at the end of the day, we are gonna get uh, for a log for a log log. So if k is log n, I'm gonna get uh, uh, poly log log. I'm oh, sorry, I'm gonna get uh, poly log k over k thin three, which for k being log n is poly log log n over log n thin three. Okay. Uh, now there is a barrier. So so this theorem that I have here, you cannot improve the tilde. So so you cannot. You cannot improve this theorem to something better than log k over k. There's like a there's like a barrier going beyond log k over k here. Uh, but there are some other ways to get around it. So with that, if so, for example, if something like this was true, if if any k connected graph has a okay, if I didn't have this assumption that k is more than log n, uh, so without this assumption. K being more than log n, I could prove the same technical theorem. I could improve the the poly log log n to probably something like uh, log star or, or two to log star, something like that. But uh, but right now, this is sort of the main technical uh, problem with pushing the approximation factor further, further to zero, two to one. And if it's if it's really poly log k over k, doesn't this answer this question you had in the beginning about 0.99? Exactly. If, if you didn't have this dependency to n, then yes, you would get uh, you would get a th log k over k thin 3 for every k connected graph. Yeah. Right. That's again the reason that we cannot solve that because we have this dependency to log n. Basically this dependency to log n comes from the this partitioning into expander parts that I didn't talk about. Okay, so if you need to graph to be highly connected to get good expanders, otherwise you won't get good expanders, and you cannot, you cannot proceed. All right, thanks. Thanks. Um, if there's no more questions, we can take it offline. I'll just remind everyone who's still around that in a couple of weeks, uh, Muli Safra will be talking about monotonicity uh, testing. Let me say maybe one more thing that uh, if anyone is interested to know more about this, I'm teaching a course about spectral graph theory and uh, connections to Kadison Singer theorem, uh, ATSP, and other stuff. This quarter, the lecture notes will be online, so if you're interested to know more about this, you can look at the lecture notes or ask me questions. Okay. Okay, thanks, Ryan. I'll, I'll take it offline, and thanks also for those joining us through YouTube. Okay.